Hi, Dr. Seth Newbart here at the 2013 North American Spine Society meeting in New Orleans, Louisiana. This is a meeting where thousands of spine surgeons come from all over the world to share ideas on new research, find out what we've done right over the last year, and maybe what we've done wrong. The meeting is broken up into different parts. There's a big technical component where all the manufacturers of spinal implants come and show their wares. There's also places for lectures to be given and posters to be shown where researchers show the latest work on what's new for spine. My job is to be an advocate for you and to come here to find out what's the latest news and treatment for cervical herniated disc disease. On the first day of the meeting, there were two papers presented that reported on the outcome comparing patients who had a disc replacement with a motion device versus a disc replacement with a fusion device. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So when we do the surgery, we remove the disc and we put an implant in the space where the disc was. This is an example of a fusion device where it's stable and it bonds the two bones together. This is an example of a motion device where we still take the disc out and we put the implant in, but this allows motion in the spine similar to what you had before the surgery. Now you would think that this is clearly absolutely the best but the studies are showing that it's about the same, maybe slightly better than the fusion. The first paper was entitled Arthroplasty, which means disreplacement with the motion device, versus anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, which means replacing the disc with a fusion device. This was a paper out of Mount Sinai School of Medicine and presented by Young Liu. This paper was a review of the recent literature comparing the efficacy, effectiveness, and safety profile of cervical disc arthroplasty versus cervical disc fusion. The conclusion was that cervical disc arthroplasty, that's with the motion, is a viable alternative procedure in the surgical management of cervical disc disease with similar safety profiles and at least equivalent and possibly superior clinical outcomes compared to cervical fusion. There does not appear to be a difference in reoperations for adjacent level degeneration between the two procedures. And he did recommend that more long-term studies are needed to make a more robust conclusion on overall effectiveness of cervical disc arthroplasty. So here was a paper where we were expecting to find one is clearly better than the other. And we didn't really find that. We found that maybe disc arthroplasty in certain patients in certain conditions was superior, but it was very, very close. And I actually was able to talk to this author after the paper and ask him, if you were having the surgery tomorrow, which would you have? And he said, without a doubt, I'd have a fusion. That same morning, there was another paper that looked at single level cervical disc arthroplasty versus anterior discectomy and fusion. This was a retrospective review comparing outcomes and complications in patients who underwent the two different operations. The conclusion was that both the disc arthroplasty and the disc fusion patients resulted in a 90% complete relief of symptoms and there was a relatively low complication rate. Patients who underwent arthroplasty had a higher rate of persistent neck pain and patients who underwent the fusion were at a risk for pseudarthrosis, which is non-union of the bone. So again, this paper we were looking for one to be clearly better than the other and they were sort of about equal. But the good news is both operations work really, really well. So the take home message is you have to speak to your doctor, to your surgeon about which would be better for you. Again, after this paper was completed, I spoke to the author. I went up there and asked him, if you were having surgery tomorrow, which surgery would you have? And without a hesitation of a doubt, he said, I would have a fusion. Besides all the scientific papers that were presented that talked about surgery, we had a lot of exhibits in the hall that talked about treatment non-surgically for cervical herniated disc disease. I found three exhibits were of interest to me showing something new and different. One of the treatments for cervical herniated disc is traction. And most of the time you do that in a physical therapy setting or with a chiropractor. Another way of doing it is at home called home cervical traction. And the ones that I've seen have, have involved mostly buying a, a harness that goes over the head attached to a pulley in the wall with a bag of water. But this is a product, um, what do you call this actually? What is this it? This is called the DDS Max, DDS cervical Max. decompression. It's got a good name and what it does is has 
an inflatable back portion, which actually, using a pump, a hand pump, you yourself as the patient can inflate this, and that puts a distraction on the device, which causes some traction in the neck. It's very simple. Attach the pump. Then you're going to inflate it. The pump is color-coded, so you inflate it up to the green very slowly. If you want to turn, they can see the back inflating. And it's now providing cervical decompression. Okay. When you reach the maximum, disconnect, and then you wear it 30 minutes, three times a day. Another interesting booth was a vendor who was selling compounding medicines. I love compounding medicines and been doing it for many, many years. Before Big Pharma moved into Big Pharma, most of the medications were compounded or made specifically for the patient's needs based on what the doctor felt was necessary. So, so basically it's taking a bunch of ingredients, putting it in a mortar and pestle and mixing it up, yep. putting a cream based on it, and then applying that. Yes. Now we so. do have, in, within our facility, we have some very um, technical uh, machinery and it's, it's, it is you know, more of a process, but we still use a mortar and pestle um, and we do grind up and make personalized medication. And that's, that is one thing that we uh, pride ourselves on by doing that. So bottom line, I think this product is good. I think it's unique because they're using compounding pharmacy to give you the medications that you need in a stronger dose and more custom made for your problem with your neck. Now this is not going to be good for a cervical herniated disc with radiculopathy, with pain down the arm with numbness and tingling. It's not going to really address those type of pains. But for neck pain and the aching that you have, it might help. And this is certainly going to be safer than taking strong anti-inflammatories by mouth. I've been using compounded, uh, a compounding pharmacy product for many, many years, probably 20 years. I have a pharmacy up uh, near my office and working with a pharmacist, and we've made up all these concoctions that patients really seem to like. So check these guys out on the internet and find a doctor in your area that can write you the prescription, and then if they don't have it in your state, if they can't supply it, I'm sure you can find a compounding pharmacy in your state. The only booth in the whole exhibit hall sponsored by the North American Spine Society was a booth on what's called MDT, which is essentially McKenzie therapy. I had a chance to speak with the head of it, Ryan Tozell, who told me how you can apply MDT, or McKenzie therapy, for treatment of the cervical herniated disc. So basically your job, one of your jobs here is to convince surgeons who could be a little aggressive with surgery to maybe consider other options before they jump to the conclusion of doing surgery for cervical herniated disc. Yeah, and I, I don't think that they jump to any conclusions. They, they want to treat their patients the best that they can, right. and they want to know what to do with the patient that they don't consider to be non-surgical and to also ensure that they have the best patient in front of them that has the that has a surgical presentation they want they want their outcomes to be just as, as, as good as they can right be. we all do That's yes true. well great well i appreciate the work you're doing here and thanks for talking to thank us thank you thank okay you for great your time. good seeing you so the bottom line is that mdt or directional preference i think is a really good thing and certainly worth trying if you can <laughs> One of the big advances in spine surgery has been the ability to monitor patient's spinal cord and spinal function during surgery. And at this meeting, there were a whole bunch of vendors who are now selling this service to hospitals and physicians. I thought this was a real uptick in this type of, um, of uh, monitoring, and I noticed at this meeting that now it's a really hot topic. So I thought I would share that with you, let you know what's going on with that, because a lot of physicians were talking to these people, and I do think it's gonna become the standard of care. We implement it in our operating room for every surgery, and I think that it's something that you as a patient should know about. I had the chance to talk to a real expert in the field, Chris Martin, who's been doing monitoring for over 20 years at his company, uh, Safe Passage, and ask him a little bit how monitoring can be used for cervical hernia disc surgery, uh, and how this makes it safer for the patient. Tell us, what is neuromonitoring? What do you actually do? So, before neuromonitoring, the surgeon would do the surgery, wake the patient up and say, can you wiggle your toes, can you squeeze my hand? They either could or they couldn't. And if they can't, it's kind of too late at that point to really help them. You know what I mean? So, so what monitoring tries to do is um, perform those tests in real time during the surgery itself and detect problems before they become a permanent issue so that by the time the surgeon's surgery is over, mm -hmm. we know we, we can predict whether they're going to wiggle their toes and squeeze it. So you're actually protecting the patient. You're sort of a layer of protection electronically, right? Electronically by running signals uh, that are going through the area of the surgery that's going to be potentially at risk right? In, uh, continually throughout the operation. So we're giving real-time feedback to the surgeon 
if we detect any, anything that indicates there might be a problem. So with a cervical herniated disc, we're working as, as a surgeon, I'm working in the neck and I'm looking right at the spinal cord and you're in the operating room with a computer hooked up by wires to the patient. So you're, I love having you there because you're protecting me and you're protecting the patient at the same time. So overall it was a good meeting. I think it reinforced what we already know, which is 90% of people get better without surgery. If you have surgery, the outcomes are excellent. And whether you have a fusion device put in or a motion device put into your neck, you're gonna do great. The difference between the two is very slight. You'll have to speak to your doctor about which one is best for you. Seth Newbart from the 2013 NAS meeting. I'll see you at the next meeting. Bye-bye.